Hello, my name is Corey McAbee. I am normal. I hope you are, too, because the ideas I would like to share with you are not normal, but with your help they can be. I would like to invite you all to join me in an idea. It is a new idea and so it is not normal yet. Now, I feel confident that everyone here would like to see the health of our planet improve, see Earth's diminishing ecosystem restored and would like to see a living ecosystem introduced to the planet Mars in a way that would involve each one of us personally. If I'm wrong and you are not interested in the health of our planet or introducing a living ecosystem to the planet Mars in a way that would involve you personally, then I apologize and you are welcome to leave. But, if these ideas do interest you then you are more than just welcome, you are necessary, you are needed, for without your support and the support of normal people, just like yourselves, the Red Planet Planning Commission would not have a future. You are necessary, you are needed, and you are invited, so please, give yourselves a round of applause. Now, what if, when your time has ended, when you have passed away or passed over, instead of following the normal procedures, being buried or cremated, things that I will talk about, instead of this your remains were composted, which is legal in select states, and sent to Mars to help establish and sustain a living ecosystem that contains your DNA, there is DNA in compost. Let Mars be your final resting place so that Mars might live, or live again. We don't know. Would you like to bring Mars to life by making it your final resting place? Now let me be clear. I am not presenting you with an opportunity to have your remains sent to Mars. I am inviting you to participate in an idea, to register your interest in this idea, and to give weight to this idea so that it may be considered normal. Only then, can it become a reality. Until then it's a game. One component of this game is to create related or parallel practices here on Earth that will benefit our ecosystem, benefit society, and as a side result help people to cope during the most difficult periods of their lives. This component will be related both symbolically and practically. It will provide functioning examples to support our idea. A new idea is a big responsibility. By approaching it together as a game we can alleviate some of the pressure, and that will allow us a great deal of freedom. So, how do we begin? It's a brand new game, so that's a very good question. According to the experts, according to the actions of those currently involved in Mars exploration and research, we should send robots first, people second, and then introduce lesser life forms to create a limited food chain. That's the exact opposite of how things worked here on Earth. A vast food chain developed, humans arrived late in the game and then we made robots. We are addressing Mars in reverse. These attempts are educational, fun to watch, and contemporary state-of-the-art brilliance, but they address Mars in complete contrast with everything that we know. We put ourselves above all other life forms because we have outgrown our place in the ecosystem. We have become the outsiders. We are unnatural. We are born in hospitals and beds and bathtubs and waiting pools. We are oftentimes kept alive artificially, and when we die we are removed from the ecosystem in ways that harm our environment. We'll talk about that in a moment. We are so far outside of Earth's ecosystem that, other than the harm we cause, we do not matter. Worms matter more than we do. If you remove all of the worms, life on Earth would cease to exist. If you eliminate all of the people, life on Earth would flourish, though head lice and body lice would also be eliminated. The numbers of rats and pigeons would decrease, but the health of their species would improve. The world's population of German cockroaches would also be reduced, but not eliminated. We will talk about them in a moment. Please know that I am not being snarky when I refer to humans as outsiders. The part of the outsider is a tragic role to play. I'm sure most of us have experienced it in our lives. If it hasn't happened to you already, it will. It comes with age. As you grow older, your numbers diminish. Your high school reunion will grow smaller and smaller. People who shared your experiences will disappear. Your social references won't make sense to young people and so your jokes won't be funny to them. Popular trends will look weird to you and you will look ridiculous if you try to embrace them. As a species our trajectory within our own lives, within society, within nature and within the universe is that of the outsider. It is a tragic role, but it is our role, and we must meet it with as much dignity as we can muster. 
Before I address the goals of the Red Planet Planning Commission, an organization that I hope you will be a part of, I would like to point out an inherent evil that underlies every plan that has ever been made for the human colonization of Mars. It is indentured servitude. It is a form of slavery. Men and women will need to sign a contract, by which they agree to work for a certain number of years in exchange for transportation, food, clothing, shelter, tools, medicine, energy, water and breathable air. Traditionally, after a period of time when a contract had ended, the freed servant was to be given a plot of land, but that didn't always happen. More often a debt was accumulated when other essentials were provided. On Mars a freed servant would be beholden to the corporation that sent them there for a continued supply of food, water and air. Their servitude would never end. On Earth credit and real estate are the key components to inequality. A Mars colony would be built on credit and real estate alone, making inequality the foundation of a Martian society. This is why we should not introduce humans to Mars as an introductory species. At the risk of sounding contradictory to what I've just said, humans should be sent to Mars first, but only as rich and valuable compost and mulch. If we want to see life on Mars, supporting the soil is one of the first steps. If it contains your DNA, well that's a bonus for you, and Mars. Some of you might be wondering if sending rockets to Mars on a regular basis could somehow have a bad effect on our environment. The answer is yes, but if managed correctly, by reducing, or even eliminating the methods that we use when managing the earthly remains of a dead human, we could actually reduce our carbon footprint and improve our environment while introducing an ecosystem to Mars. I could offer you information about the environmentally devastating effects of cremations and traditional burials, but I won't, because it is boring and unpleasant. If you would like a brief description, please visit redplanetplanningcommission.com. While you're there, please register. Show the world that you are interested in this program, help to normalize new ideas, which I am excited to now share with you. There are videos, images and a suggested donation fee, so please visit redplanetplanningcommission.com. Human Composting In 2019 Washington became the first state in the U.S. to legalize human composting. I know that the concept of human composting is disgusting to some of you. That's because it is new. A newborn baby is also disgusting, but we learn to love them and that's how our species has been able to survive. If we are going to survive we need to find the beauty in new practices and new ideas. We need to highlight that beauty while bringing more beauty to it. How do we bring beauty to a decomposing human? Well, we can't. At least not at the moment. We can, however, increase the beauty of nature in the already beautiful natural and organic burial grounds that have recently become popular throughout the U.S. The Red Planet Planning Commission is using the beautification and wildlife restoration of green burial grounds as a symbolic act to illustrate our goals. I will talk more about that in a moment. Now, please do not answer this next question aloud. Keep the answer to yourself and let's see if I am right. Here is the question, what are the three primary components to life on Earth? I will repeat the question, what are the three primary components to life on Earth? Take a moment to think about it. Did anyone answer death? No. Without death there could be no life. Death is essential. It is an integral part of an interconnected system. It is the reincarnation of the physical. It is the redistribution of nutrients, water, and carbon. The redistribution of carbon is what makes plants grow. Depriving the ecosystem of our carbon and nutrients became popularized during the American Civil War in 1861. Before the Civil War chemical embalming was seen as foreign, it was viewed as another disrespectful act committed by the French. It became acceptable as a way of returning dead soldiers to their families, because trains would not ship rotting corpses, and there were a lot of them. By the end of the Civil War, in 1864, chemical embalming was considered normal. Slaves were given the rights of human beings, though many became indentured servants as their only means of survival. Under the same law corporations were also given the rights of human beings. Leaders in the field of Mars exploration are planning to send indentured servitude and corporate structures to Mars. What it needs first is life and death, hand in hand and side by side. This can be achieved without sacrificing our own species. 
I will talk more about that in a moment. In preparation for that part of our conversation I would like to talk with you about electricity. When it comes to understanding electricity we are in the Stone Age. Electricity is what separates the living from the dead. The electricity that we possess can only be compared to the electricity that powers our machines if we use the same archaic tools to measure them both. We recognize electricity as the chained flow of electrons between molecules. We believe there are only two types of electricity. Restricting our understanding to this premature conclusion has allowed mental illness to flourish within our society. We attribute our evolutionary changes to combinations in our DNA, which is only a protein, while ignoring our electrical identities, each as unique and individual to us as our fingerprints. Our electricity informs our DNA. It also affects, and can even alter, the mental and physical growth of those around us. If a newborn baby is placed in an environment that meets all of its physical needs, but has no physical contact with another person it will stop growing and die. This is called, failure to thrive. A baby requires the electrical information of others, or it cannot continue. The genetic information is still within the child, but it needs to be decoded. It needs to be interpreted. Electrical information is the interpreter. Its decisions are motivated by internal and external influences. Internal being the organic nature of electrical information. External being the cause and effect of exposure to the EI of others through physical contact or proximity. I refer to electrical information as EI because it is important to separate the electricity that's within us from the two base concepts that are used to categorize all electricity. With your permission, I would now like to share something personal with you. When my daughter was born I suffered from panic attacks. I became anxious, angry and paranoid. I never acted on or expressed these feelings. I endured them quietly. When I held my daughter every worst case scenario that could possibly happen raced through my mind. It was overwhelming. As this was happening I had the horrible feeling that the negative energy I was experiencing was infecting and shaping my baby. Today she is a young adult. She suffers from what I had suffered, but on a more extreme level. Two courses of action have been recommended. One is to have regularly scheduled conversations with doctors. The second is physical alteration through chemicals. The prescriptions are either social or mechanical. Mechanical being physical change through the use of chemicals. There are no programs available to address her EI. It will go untreated and it will affect others. On a lighter note, I took my family to the aquarium. There was an electric eel sitting motionless at the bottom of a tank. I put my hand against the tank. The eel moved toward my hand and began moving in a slow, repetitive motion. When I removed my hand it stopped. When my son put his hand against the tank the eel began thrashing violently. When he removed his hand it stopped. We repeated the experiment and got the same results each time. The eel was blind. His species hunts by sensing electrical impulses emitted by other fish. It was responding to the individual characteristics of our electrical information. When we die, our protein, our water, our nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium and so on, are redistributed into the environment, as is our electrical information. It is absorbed and reused. On Mars there is no electrical information, because nothing has died there, at least not that we know of, but let's assume that nothing has. Let's assume that there is no electrical information for new life to take hold of. To build a living ecosystem that would eventually consist of animals, we would need to supply electrical information. We would have to introduce it. The trick is to start small. On that note, let me tell you my feelings about cockroaches. I like them. My favorites are the German cockroaches. They are the most common ones. They're the small ones that invade our homes. Millions of dollars are spent each year to have them killed because they are great at what they do. They think, they adapt and they survive. They are smart, gentle and agile. Each colony is unique. The lifestyle, living space, and habits of each colony are dictated by the personalities of its members. They develop relationships based on their personalities. They care for their young. Some are aggressive. Some are shy. Some exhibit empathy. Some develop strong attachments to individuals within their group. As a human you can win their trust. You can get them to eat out of your hand. They are curious about you. You should be flattered. They are an amazing species. Fossil evidence indicates that cockroaches have been on Earth for over 300 million years. 
they lived on Pangaea. In terms of adaptability and survival, they are among the most successful animals on Earth. The German cockroach can live for a month without food and eat almost anything. They build their camps inside structures where water is available. The Asian cockroach, their almost identical cousin, favors the outdoors. They thrive in compost. Unlike the German cockroach, the Asian cockroach is able to fly. Both species can withstand up to 15 times more radiation than humans. Studies have shown that they can go up to 40 minutes without breathing if necessary. Scientists also believe that they will sometimes hold their breath to prevent water loss. It is for all of these reasons that the Red Planet Planning Commission would like to nominate the German cockroach and the Asian cockroach as Earth's introductory ambassadors to Mars. They will probably only live for a short while, but while they are alive, Life will exist on Mars. Light that walked on Pangaea will walk freely on the surface of Mars. That act of our planet's children, which they are, walking naked, barefoot and free on the surface of Mars will have more significance for both planets and for all life on Earth than would sending a human to live in an artificial bubble. When our tiny pioneers exhaust their resources they will pass away. Their bodies will not deteriorate, but their electrical information will be absorbed into the environment. That is what is being offered and that is what is required. The Red Planet Planning Commission is currently proposing a two-fold function. Diagrams are now being developed as ideas are being explored. Function number one, human compost distribution for the enrichment of Martian soil. This is a standalone concept. It does not require the Little Ambassador Program. Function number two, the Little Ambassador Program. In conjunction with the compost piles we are proposing a two-compartment capsule. One compartment would house the German cockroaches, the other compartment would house the Asian cockroaches. Both compartments would be open, allowing the cockroaches to enter and exit, as they please. The Asian cockroaches would most likely take advantage of the compost while we could expect most of the German cockroaches to remain indoors. There are usually explorers within their group. It's difficult to anticipate their behavior in these circumstances. There would of course be documentation. The Red Planet Planning Commission does not have the technology to support these ideas, but we do have connections with experts and individuals currently working in the field of science and space exploration. I know from experience that they will be interested in discussing these ideas and monitoring our progress. I will keep them updated as we proceed. While we investigate and develop these off-world concepts, it is important to develop similar practices here on Earth. The Red Planet Planning Commission Annex program will be introduced in organic cemeteries, or, green burial grounds throughout the U.S. I will explain the Annex program in a moment, but first I would like to thank our Board of Advisors for their support in these programs. On our board we have Joe C. Lee. Mr. C. He is the founder of the Green Burial Council and will be working as our liaison to organic cemeteries throughout the U.S. Also on our board, we are proud to have the guidance and support of neurological researcher Dr. Karen Froud. Dr. Froud is a professor of neuroscience and education in the Department of Biobehavioral Sciences at the Teachers College of Columbia University. We are also honored to have with us Professor John Modern. Professor Modern is the head of the Religious Studies Department at Franklin and Marshall College where he teaches American religious history, literature and technology. We are also privileged to have the support of theoretical quantum chemist Dr. Prakash Verma. Dr. Verma is currently developing software for making calculations on a quantum level. Let's have a round of applause for our Board of Advisors. Red Planet Planning Commission Annex Program is a hands-on user-friendly program that takes place here on Earth. It can stand as a living, functioning example of the ideas that we are currently developing to support a living ecosystem on Mars. Instead of human composting facilities we will begin with beautiful organic burial grounds. Instead of cockroaches, we will start with butterflies. Monarch butterflies offer a shining example of electrical information in action. Every year millions of monarch butterflies migrate from Canada to Mexico and back. Smaller, yet substantial numbers, also migrate from Canada to Florida, while a separate population migrates to and from the Rockies to the West Coast. 
these animals are able to navigate their way from Canada to a small plot of forest in Mexico, a place they have never been, and have been separated from for four generations, with accuracy. That is a demonstration of the transference of electrical information. Monarch butterflies born in captivity for more than several generations are unable to make this journey. Their electrical information evolves to match their environment, as does ours. Over recent years the numbers of monarch butterflies have fallen drastically, partly due to climate change, but also because of the removal of milkweed from our environment. By reintroducing the maximum organic amounts of indigenous milkweed to organic memorial grounds along the monarch migration paths, we can bolster their numbers and also help to restore local wildlife. These butterflies are an important pollinating species, as well as an important food source for birds, smaller animals and other insects. Whether you connect the spirits of the departed with butterflies or if you just think they're beautiful, an influx in monarch butterflies in a memorial ground will be a welcome event. It's the perfect organic installation. The beauty of this natural occurrence can be therapeutic for the bereaved. The milkweed flowers are beautiful in themselves. As the butterflies feed off the milkweed, the milkweed will be feeding off of human decomposition. With the Martian environment being what it is today a human body would not decompose. That process would need to happen before we arrived on Mars. It would also be cheaper to send compost than living human beings. Butterflies would never survive on Mars. Cockroaches can. If cockroaches were somehow able to adapt, survive beyond their supplies and flourish, that would potentially work to our advantage. And unlike monarch butterflies, cockroaches are edible. I would like to reiterate that we do not have the funds to send human compost, cockroaches, or anything else to Mars at this point in time. It is an idea. We are registering interest in this idea to give it weight to make it normal. The lack of funds works to our advantage. It means we are not beholden to anyone. We are free to explore this idea in every way that we can possibly imagine. We will however be able to initiate the Red Planet Planning Commission's parallel project, Red Planet Planning Commission Annex. Integrating organic burial practices in support of wildlife is what we hope to achieve on Mars. Let's do it here first, let's create user-friendly experiences and let's keep this conversation moving forward. Thank you for listening to this. Please visit redplanetplanningcommission.com to register your interest in this project. We need documented interest. We need you. My name is Corey McAbee. I am normal and I will use it to all of our advantage. Thank you again. Good night. RedPlanetPlanningCommission.com